Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hello? Hey guys, how's it going? Alright. Let's do it. Austro-Prussian War. My back itches and I can't reach it. There we go. Yeah, I found one on Allegia. Uh, one about the Austro-Prussian War. I want to learn about it. Uh, let's do it. If you're new to the channel, my name's Connor. Hello. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. Join the Discord. The original link to this video will be at the top description below. The Discord link will be right below that. Love for you to join us. Pull up a chair. More the merrier. Love to have you. Okay. If you're not ready to learn, just get the hell out of here. Just get out. Or just chill. That's fine, too. All right. Let's do it. Go. Europe has always... Hope you're all doing good, by the way. Europe has always been home to conflicts and power struggles across the map. For a continent so big and intertwined, and with frequently shifting borders all throughout its history, it's no surprise that war would often become inevitable. In the case of Central Europe, as the second half of the 19th century came around, the clash for dominance and consolidated power over the region would be between the mighty Austrian Empire and the rising state of Prussia. Prussia at the time was part of the German Confederation and was becoming the most powerful and influential of the incorporated states next to the Austrian Empire. Its leaders were the Hohenzollern family and in particular King Wilhelm I, a so, influential of the incorporated German Confederation. So the German Confederation had parts of Austria and Prussia in it, so Austria and Prussia each controlled a little bit of territory in the of Prussia. Prussia at the time was part of the German Confederation and was becoming the most powerful and influential of the incorporated states next to the Austrian Empire. So is this almost like a civil war almost? It's full Sorry. and influential of the incorporated states next to the Austrian Empire. Its leaders were the Hohenzollern family and in particular King Wilhelm I alongside Prime Minister Otto von Bismarck. On the other end, over the border in Austria, Emperor Franz Joseph I of the Habsburgs dynasty held the throne. Although these rulers were developing a little bit of a rivalry between themselves, with both sides hoping to claim control over Central Europe and of the German-speaking nations, they did have a brief moment of cooperation during the Second Schleswig War. Prussia and Austria decided to invade the Danish-controlled land of Schleswig-Holstein together and were successful in co-occupying the territory after the end of the war. A new crisis erupted in 1866, though, after Prussia took umbrage at political decisions made by the Austrian governor of Holstein. This sparked disputes between both sides and eventually led to Austria sending in precautionary troops along the Prussian border. In response, the Prussians partially mobilized five of their divisions at the end of March. Both parties now began preparing for war with each other, and Otto von Bismarck of Prussia had the idea to reach out to a more southern ally. On April 8th, Italy agreed that if Prussia went to war against Austria in the next 90 days... So did, did they want to invade... I guess they both wanted to invade what is now Des, uh, Denmark, what is Schleswig and Holstein. So they were already really high tensions before going in there, and so that was kind of an act of unity, conquering that together, and it inevitably just led to conflict. Italy agreed that if Prussia went to war against Austria in the next 90 days, it would join the German state in an attempt to push back against Austria's power. This deal would secure the soon-to-come declaration of war from Bismarck and his allies. Austria was aware of this newfound friendship, though, 
and began mobilizing its own troops along the Italian border on April 21st. Italy then called for a general mobilization five days later, and Austria did the same thing on the following day. Now, it was Prussia's turn. Although its general mobilization occurred in a step-by-step -step process between the 3rd and the 12th of May, as all three sides were becoming more and more ready for battle, multiple German states began to form alliances with Austria. In hopes of counteracting really? this, Prussia invaded Hanover, Hesse, and Saxony on June 15th before they could put any real support behind Austria. Five days later, just as they had promised, Italy declared war on Austria and came to Prussia's aid. On June 27th, behind Austria, five days later, just as they had promised any real support behind Austria, five days later, just as they had promised, Italy declared war on Austria and came to Prussia's aid. On June 27th, Prussia faced their first loss at the Battle of Lagenzalza against Hanover, although their victory for the latter was short-lived, as the rest of Prussia's troops eventually surrounded them and forced them to surrender. The Austrian commander, Ludwig Benedict, was hesitant to take his own troops into direct conflict and showed major signs of indecisiveness, even as his Prussian counterparts moved with meticulous and extreme confidence. The Austrians, despite outnumbering the Prussians, were becoming surrounded and pushed back as their enemies fought with intelligent aggression. By the start of July, Benedict had given up hope and ordered a withdrawal of his men. He sent a plea to Emperor Franz Joseph, begging him to make peace with the Prussians to avoid what he predicted would be a catastrophe for the Austrian army. Much to Benedict's dismay, the Emperor flat out refused. Now, the main portion of the war was about to take place. On the 3rd of July, the Prussian Army of the Elbe and the Prussian First Army were ready to attack the Austrian army at the Battle of Konigratz. While the Austrians numbered around 215,000, the Prussians only added up to about 124,000. Nonetheless, it was the Prussians who proved most offensive. As mist cleared from the air and the night's rainfall came to an end, the Austrian army opened fire on the Prussian right flank, which was under the command of Herwart von Bittenfield. For what seemed to be the first time, the Prussians were now hesitant. Bittenfield was unsure of whether a full attack would be wise at this point, eventually ordered Brigadier General von Schuler to fall back into a defensive position with seven battalions of the advance guard. Meanwhile, General Edward Frederick Charles von Franziki led the Prussian 7th Division into the Sweep Forest and eventually ran into two Austrian corps. Somehow, the 7th Division proved successful in clearing the forest, and King Wilhelm ordered the 1st Army to join General Franziki as he led his men into Sadova, which was shortly captured. Still, as the Prussian 8th and 4th Divisions tried to cross the Bistersitze River and join their fellow troops, they were stopped in their tracks by heavy Austrian artillery fire. Oddly though, Benedict opted not to order a cavalry charge at the same time, which allowed the Prussians to maintain some level of resistance. The Just want to do a recap quick before we continue with the battle. Austria and Prussia both having some territory in that kind of German zone. They are a little bit of tensions. They went and conquered part of Denmark, Denmark together. They partitioned it north-south. Uh, the southern part was by Austria. They're making some rulings that Prussia didn't like, and they were putting troops there. And then Italy said they would join uh, Russia, uh, join Prussia if Austria did anything. They started all of the German kind of states that weren't directly under control of either side, started taking sides, mostly with the Austrians. Fighting has begun. I'm just trying to make sure I absorb some stuff. The Austrians same time, which allowed the Prussians to maintain Let me know if I got some anything level wrong. of resistance. The Austrians still had significantly better weaponry for long range, and of course, still outnumbered their adversaries. And a lucky advantage for the Prussians, though, the Austrians had not been prepared for the kind of close combat that they found themselves in against the 7th Division back in the forest. This is where the tide began to turn in favor of the Prussians. 
as the Austrians with their muzzle-loading small arms clashed with the Prussians and their breech-loading needle guns, the situation began to support the latter, who were able to... I love operate. how we're seeing in this part of the, uh, of history and, you know, the 19th century, the transition of loading your ammunition like you would an old-style cannon from the front and packing it down, firing to a more classic, or to a more modern what we real know of today of like loading from the back per uh percussion or whatever it is and uh yeah i love seeing the evolution of weapons breech loading needle guns the situation began to support the latter who were able to operate their weaponry while on the move and didn't have to stay standing while reloading although the prussians were temporarily pushed back the austrians made yet another mistake when benedict refused to launch a f sorry I, I love that over decades and centuries whatever since the the emergence of of a rifle in in you know common infantry and battle the because of it's amazing destruction power cannons and rifles but the problem is in close combat you know the problem is reloading it takes a long while to reload and so you shoot you're very vulnerable and so they spend centuries or decades at least many many decades coming up with new tactics like the square formation and like the uh, the rows of things where the first row shoots they reload the second row shoots. They reload the third row shoots. They reload the first row is reloaded and, and again. And now we're seeing a giant shift again. I love how in the 19th century warfare, it, it seems to be this is where warfare technology really goes exponential. Like I said in, in another video, a few videos back, like it went from somewhat linear to just it seems like each battle you have to change these long-standing tactics you had and old generals might for once be somewhat uh hampered by their experience rather i, I don't want to go that far but i just i love how we're seeing that exponential increase in, in weaponry and how it completely makes you throw out other uh conventional means of of protection and formation i love that Full the Austrians made yet another mistake when Benedict refused to launch a full-blown counterattack against both Prussian Did I miss something? were temporarily pushed didn't have to stay standing while reloading. Although the Prussians were temporarily pushed back, the Austrians made yet another mistake when Benedict refused to launch a full-blown counterattack against both Prussian armies. Instead, the Prussians fought back harder than ever and managed to wipe out Austria's battalion under Colonel Karl von Pock as the Prussian Second Army entered the battle, led by none other than the Crown Prince himself. The Austrian 2nd and 4th Corps continued to fight as best as they could, but the Prussians were more unified than ever before, and the Austrian defense was crumbling. As the final fragments of the Prince's nearly 100,000 strong 2nd Army arrived and clashed with the Austrians, the latter began to realize their fate. They were taking mass casualties, and eventually Benedict himself decided to inform the Emperor of the catastrophe that was occurring, just as he had warned earlier. The battle was over, and the Prussians had come out on top. As the Austrians retreated, some of the Prussian forces chased them towards Vienna and clashed with them along the way. These smaller skirmishes continued until July 22nd, ending only when an armistice was finally reached. The Peace of Prague was then signed on August 23rd and officially ended the Austro-Prussian War. Wow, that Luckily was quick. That was just... How do I explain how I feel about this? It seems like this war, I know there's there's th three minutes left, but it seems like this was like a, a half heart, like a half-assed war, almost. I'm no historian, okay? I did get a history degree, I know, four years in college, I know. I don't think I'm a historian at all. I didn't even learn that much. I did what I did to get by, but um, I'm learning about history through YouTube. I want to keep growing my knowledge. So, again, I know, let me know if I say something stupid or wrong or you disagree with, or let me know if I'm right, maybe. Uh, but it seems like this war is 
is very unlike other wars. It, it almost seems like a civil war between two different nations, which is an oxymoron. But it, that's really what it sort of feels like. And it was just kind of, you're both kind of on edge, and then like, oh, let's do this thing together. And then it's like, oh, we did that, but now what are you doing down here? And now, oh, soldiers are, are, form, are forming or being sent in. And they have one big clash in, uh, you know, a bunch of the different sides are, uh, obviously I need to watch another video about all of this. You know, this is, these videos aren't always meant to just, all right, now move on. I know everything about this, uh, Austro-Prussian war. I know that, but it, it seems like, you know, they had a big victory, the Prussians, and then the Prussians kind of had a small defeat and then they had a bigger war. The Prussians won and now it's over. It almost seems like. It was like a, it was like a, a civil war between two nations, an oxymoron. Really, for the Austrians, this treaty was actually very fair to the empire. Otto von Bismarck was a strategic man and had decided that the best option for Prussia would be to maintain a strong Austrian empire and essentially create an ally for themselves against the rest of Europe, whom Bismarck did not trust. Initially, King Wilhelm starkly disagreed with his prime minister and refused to do away with any harsh terms against Austria. It wasn't until Bismarck threatened not only to resign, but even to jump out of the fourth story Nikolsburg castle window and agreed to give some favor to their adversary. No new territory. Did this come up in the extra credits? Otto, no, we have to keep the, the strong options on the table. No, or I'm jumping out the window. All right, fine, fine. Castle window and agreed to give some favor to their adversary. No new territory was taken from Austria itself at the request of Bismarck, but the Austrians were forced to give up Schleswig-Holstein, Hanover, and some parts of Hesse and Bavaria to the- I'm very confused what the green is. It's definitely not Italy, Italian territory. So what is the green? Prussians, not if, being Hanover. If it said it and I missed it, I'm sorry. And some parts of Hesse and Bavaria to the Prussians. Nonetheless, the end of the war and the signing of this treaty confirmed Prussia's newfound authority throughout the region and confederation. And soon, the German states would become united under Emperor Wilhelm I without Austria. Before that, though, the Treaty of Vienna had been signed on October 3rd, 1860. The main campaign of the war occurred in Bohemia, where Prussia proved superior in battles. Also, the Austrians had more success in their war against Italy. Austria defeated Italy on land at the Battle of Costoza on the 24th of June and on, on sea at the Battle of Lisa, 20th of July. However, Italians defeated the Austrians at the Battle of... 66, after the Third War of Italian... Conquer the... Peace between Prussia and Austria, the Italian government was forced to seek an armistice with Austria too. According to the Treaty of Vienna, signed on 12th of October, Austria ceded Veneto to France, which in turn ceded it to Italy as a... Okay, as agreed in a secret treaty with Prussia, Austria then lost the influence over smaller member states of the former German Confederation. After the defeat, the Austrian Empire was transformed into the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Oh! You guys are telling me there's a difference between the Austro... the Austrian Empire empire or whatever good point uh prussia formed the northern german confederation after the war against france germany will be united under prussian rule independence which had occurred throughout the austro-prussian war after italy came to prussia's defense this treaty confirmed an earlier armistice between the nations and forced the austrians to hand over venetia to the italians and a large chunk of friuli to the french who would then transfer power to the italians as well these were significant losses for the Austrian Empire, of course, but they were still mild in comparison to what Prussia and Italy as its ally could have demanded if not for the insistence of Bismarck, which would later come in handy at the outbreak Bismarck. of World War I. While the events leading I up to the Austro-Prussian War had almost seemed to symbolize a new, stronger relationship between Prussia and Austria, this outcome would never come to fruition. 
The war instead drew a wedge between Austria and Prussia, and even between the latter and some of the southern German states. Though many mistakes made by Austrian military leadership and some luck on the part of the Prussians, the struggle would prove the dominance of Prussia in Central Europe and within the German Confederation. Not only that, but Prussia's victory only strengthened its authority and influence, which would continue to grow for decades to come. And although the resulting dissolution of the German Confederation and division between Austria and Prussia would end any hope of a united Germany that incorporated Austria, the Germans would not quit trying for many years to come. Awesome video. Uh, this really let me uh, explain to me just when Germany started to become that superpower like France and, and the UK and the United States, or France and the UK for sure, and this seems to be the beginning of that. I love when channels help me learn stuff like that. Great video. Keep recommending. Join the Discord, guys. I will see you in a bit. How am I not subscribed? Subscribe to them for sure. See you guys next time.